morning, everybody. We are we are going to wait a little bit uh, before I do introductions so that people because people are, are logging on now. So uh, hope you have a, a warm beverage in front of you. You can sit down and relax and enjoy this this presentation. We are so fortunate to be able to have Dr. Solomon join us today. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to have him join us in person because of the weather on the East Coast, but we are so grateful for technology that allows us to have him join us via Zoom. So uh, welcome to this uh, morning session of Vital Voices. I believe this is the first time we've had a, uh, an 11 o'clock session for Vital Voices. So this year, you, you guys are the first to uh, witness this. So thank you for joining us. Um, I am going to uh, tell you a little bit about Vital Voices. We like to bring people to uh, our, our college to talk about things that are interdisciplinary with our disciplines of social work, urban ed, and cr uh, criminal justice. And so we've brought in a slew of people uh, who talk about all these different things. Next week, we're going to be having a superintendent's roundtable with superintendents from five local area super, uh, districts, school districts, as well as the division director for Hispanic serving institutions uh, from the U.S. Department of Education. So that's going to be coming on uh, actually on Tuesday evening. The following Monday evening, we're going to be having another Vital Voices about how to engage families and communities in the education process. We recently had a person uh, who was given a life sentence talk about his, his uh, sentence and the restorative justice that he's experienced after he was pardoned and released. Um, we just we have a, a wide range of, of topics that we cover. So I encourage you to look for look out for our emails uh, because I'm sure there's going to be something that you uh, are going to want, find interesting. So with that, I'm going to turn the uh, hosting duties over to our associate um, dean, Dr. Ashley Blackburn. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this uh, to this wonderful event that we're about to, to begin. Uh, as Mr. Villano said, uh, I am Dr. Ashley Blackburn and I currently serve as the Associate Dean for the College of Public Service. Um, I am so glad to be here um, and I'm here on behalf of our Dean, uh, John Schwartz, who um, who had a, a meeting, but he, he is, uh, is so uh, glad that we're able to uh, to have Dr. Solomon with us and to have such a wonderful event on today. Um, I just wanted to reiterate how, um, how important Dr. Solomon's work is, particularly with the goals of the college. So as Mr. Volano mentioned, we have uh, three disciplines in the college, uh, social work, urban education, and criminal justice. And in all three of the, these disciplines, uh, a college priority for us is to have students working in the community, getting hands-on experiential uh, uh, experiences in their fields of study. And we feel that there's no better way for them to be prepared to be professionals in, in those fields. So, um, so with... Um, with doctors, Dr. Solomon's expertise in this area, especially, uh, and also the 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 uh, focus on globalization and really thinking beyond uh, how we can impact our world beyond uh, the city of Houston, um, Harris County, Texas, the United States, on and on. Uh, I, this is something that I focus on in my classes. And I really encourage our students to think about the global impact, our, um, our, uh, our behaviors are, and um, the way we interact with one another, the decisions we make, uh, all our, our policies and procedures, all of those things uh, within our different social systems, how they have not only a local uh, impact on our communities, but also impact uh, greater, um, you know, the greater good. And so uh, I just want to again say welcome to all of you who are able to join us uh, here this, this, uh, this morning and uh, to those of you who will watch later. And I want to give a special welcome uh, to Dr. Solomon. But first, I would like to introduce Dr. Savani, who is one of our 
uh, social work professors, and, uh, and she is going to give you a, a little more uh, information about Dr. Solomon and his work, and, and particularly its impact on the field of social work. So, Dr. Savani. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, lecture on modern day slavery, social work, and the caste system in India. I want to take a minute to introduce Dr. Solomon. We are so very grateful to Dr. Solomon that he has agreed to join us today on Zoom. Um, Dr. Solomon is an assistant professor of social work and coordinator of field education at Madras Christian College in India. He is also currently a visiting scholar at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. He has two decades of experience in training social work students, including international social work students during through the field experience with tribal communities. He has pioneered the field action programs at the Department of Social Work and has a wide range of experience in working with particularly vulnerable type tribal groups and indigenous populations. Dr. Solomon continues to work towards inclusion, social justice and empowerment within vulnerable communities and to make social work education relevant in our times. Dr. Solomon and the School of Social Work at Madras Christian College is also our host when we visit, uh, when we take students to India on our study abroad uh, course. So if you ever get a chance to come to our study abroad course and go to India, you will see the phenomenal, and I mean absolutely phenomenal work that Dr. Solomon and his students are doing in the tribal communities. So with that, I want us to welcome Dr. Prince Solomon. You're muted, Dr. Solomon. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shanaz. Thank you, Stephen, uh, Dr. Ashley. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you that I could uh, be with you all and uh, join you here today. Um, uh, I have only a few things to say before I start my presentation. I think anybody who's uh, wanting to ask the questions in between, I think that will be more engaging uh, as we do this uh, presentation, as I do this presentation. So there's a Q&A box, so kindly type in your questions. So uh, we will try to answer it contextually so that it will be easier for me and for you and it will be engaging. Otherwise, it will be a monologue. So it will be great if you could uh, you know, type in your questions in between. So uh, you're free to, I, I will be happy to answer the questions if I could. Um, and um, so I will go into my presentation. So let me share my screen. So this is Madras Christian College. This is where I come from. So just a brief introduction that, um, so we are a college, we are an, I, I come from a college which is affiliated to the University of Madras. And then uh, the college has a very, very strong uh, campus community uh, connect. I would call it the CCC. Um, probably in some terms, we call it uh, service learning. Uh, where we expect our students to connect to the local community and thereby, uh, you know, that the real life experience, the learning to learn comes or linking learning to life that comes uh, through uh, every student who walks into the campus that we want them to be connected to their neighborhood. There is a quote by one of our former principals that says, a campus that is not concerned about the neighborhood does not have a right to exist because we are not here to merely give degrees, but I think uh, we need to connect to the local community and be relevant to them. Otherwise, the, the campus doesn't have meaning, and that is what he meant to say. So this is our beautiful campus. We love this campus. Um, we have deers on campus. Uh, we have a little lake, and uh, this is some pictures of uh, some camps that we have done. So 
so that is where I come from. So let me go into the topic. So modern day slavery, I think it is a, um, it's a painful thing to even to hear the word slavery uh, in 21st century. As we are proceeding, as we are progressing uh, towards, um, you know, um, breaking the shackles of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the chains or as, as slaves, I think we have heard that um, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, we have heard this uh, slavery as a part and parcel of some of the communities across the globe. And uh, it is very painful to even to hear there are slavery existing even today. So uh, I have entitled, as you know, that the, as uh, your campaign to come for this particular uh, presentation, that is, it is modern day slavery, social work, and the caste system in India. So I'm going to quickly uh, unwrap this by just giving a small introduction about what social work is all about and how we went about uh, doing social work and what is the stage in which where we do as social work in professionally and uh, uh, in, in terms of social service. So let me unwrap for you. So um, you see in uh, the slide number one that I put uh, here that you see that the charity, I think uh, any community in that matter, I think um, uh, charity was the beginning of all the other support and help that uh, began in this world. So you would see charity was our first model and it is still happening. I think it's all across the globe, you'll see charity as one model. And then it moved to welfare. Welfare is a little more organized and that is how it came to welfare. And then it moved to development, area development programs or village development programs or urban development programs. I think these are development programs merely to develop infrastructure so that people can have a happy life. And then it moved to a stage where, especially in the 80s, probably I would say, you know, the word empowerment, uh, you know, was a very, um, very common word or when even in 90s you know the word empowerment to talk about how uh, we need to empower people are probably more on advocacy and the skill sets that we want to give to people so that they can you know come out and uh, you know achieve what they want to do and their needs can be satisfied and then today i think you all know from the humanities side if some of you from the humanities or the social science side you will know the buzzword is sustainability everybody wants to have a project that is sustainable. We want communities that is sustainable. We want everything, uh, you know, the sustainable. I think we also know the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals that is formed, you know, because the word sustainability is a key word now. Uh, and, and I think even in the social field in India, I think this is what we do. But even though we have come to this stage, but we still practice charity, welfare, development, empowerment, all these things, you know, are there. And you know we have not moved completely from one phase to another, but we are just traveling along. Uh, if you see the slide two, you know I put the word. I mean the year 1936. 1936 is the year that we actually started uh, the social work program, uh, thanks to an American actually who came and um, started this uh, social work program in India. The first ever social work program was started by an American. He is a Baptist missionary who the Baptist mission felt that he will be doing more damage uh, if he is in the church. So he, they asked him to come to the community service uh, because uh, he had radical ideas to help people. So he came to uh, the slums of Mumbai uh, in the early um, 1920s. And then he started to work with the people. And then it, his name is Dr. Clifford. And Dr. Clifford found that, you know, he, it is better that we have formal training. So he, he initiated that and formal training was, has started. And once the formal training started uh, in 1936, um, then within the 10 years time that we got independence and the post-independence actually created a, uh, you know, uh, the growth of social work program. And uh, I would say whimsical growth because we still do not have a, a council uh, that uh, actually uh, standardizes the social work program. So what is happening is, you know, it is growing, um, you know, in its own directions uh, without uh, much, uh, you know, uh, coordination. 
So, and also we have specializations, which is a little different from what we see it in the US. Now we have uh, community development is one of the specializations, uh, clinical social work, medical and psychiatric social work. Then we have um, um, uh, specializations like human resource management. I think that's the only part of the world where we have human resource management as part of social work. Uh, uh, that is also because of uh, the Factories Act, which has a welfare officer. So uh, in fact, Dr. Clifford, uh, the, the, the American who, who started the social work program, he wanted to start to train people so that people can be welfare officers in the factories so that there is better living there. So uh, this is a little um, background of uh, the social work in India. We also have family and child care as a specialization. We have uh, tribal development, human rights, there are a number of specializations. It is increasing as the days go by. There are super specializations. Of course, uh, who does that? Who does social work? I think individuals who are um, you know, driven towards that, a lot of religious activities because uh, religion is a very, very, uh, it probably it is, it's, it is the artery, I would say, uh, not even a vein, but it's an artery of our Indian uh, society. Um, that uh, we are extremely religious and that is as a community, we are also trying to see how each religion in its own way that there is charity and welfare and development is taking place either through NGOs or INGOs or through the government. The government has a central social welfare board and uh, that uh, is the apex body. And then from there, it goes to uh, state social welfare board. So that's how the welfare is um, maintained. Um, now, there are challenges. That is what I put. Uh, I think the challenges is diversity, which I'm going to talk to you about. And uh, I'm also going to talk to you about the population, um, that we are ever increasing population. And um, of course, corruption is there. If you see the corruption index, uh, you will know where we stand. Um, uh, existing with chaos, I think, um, 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 you know, the easiest way that I can explain is I'm here in, in the US uh, for the last uh, two months. Now, um, one thing that I could see is uh, the roads. You know, one, one is I don't hardly see people here. There, there are so many people. And then I see, um, you know, cars and buses go in lanes. But uh, probably um, uh, if I have to drive here, it is not, it is less exciting for me because there is, uh, you know, uh, everybody is following the lane. Uh, but, you know, if you see the, uh, when I say existing with chaos, especially in roads, but everybody goes and makes their own way and then they still manage to live. Uh, and then we still manage to live. So, so there, is, there is a chaos, but there is an order in that chaos also. And then we coexist with each other. Um, politics to religion. I think uh, each one would like to pick up um, religion uh, with politics. And I think uh, that's not a very good uh, uh, stand uh, to make. And, and uh, that is also a big challenge right now um, as I'm doing this presentation. And this is one of the issues that I'm, we're facing. Let's move to um, the diversity in India. Um, I think uh, you should be uh, knowing this, some of you, if you have read about India, if you have not heard about it, I'm sure it will be a surprise, pleasant surprise. So diversity in India, and I put a miracle country. Definitely our country is a miracle country because with the kind of diversity that we have and how we have even managed to survive together as a country post-independence or pre-independence, I think that is amazing that I would say. Um, uh, 18th February, uh, around one o'clock, I took this population uh, check and it says we have 1.4 billion people. I think um, you can um, imagine the state, the infrastructure, everything has to grow along with this population, be it education, be it health sector, be it welfare, you know, it has to go along with this population, 1.4 billion, and it keeps increasing. And then we have uh, 30 different states and uh, six union territories. And each state has its own language. Each state has its own identity. Each state has a different set of dress and patterns of dress. Each state has their own food. 
So let's say I'm traveling from South India to North India um, and I'm or from North to South or East to West, I come across at least five different states or six different states I need to cross. I'm talking about traveling in a train. So if when I travel through the train, then I may have to probably, I may, uh, you know, get to eat different kinds of food, different kinds of uh, language I get to hear, different kinds of passengers who will walk in. Probably it is very difficult to master all these languages also. I'm coming to the language now. Uh, then comes the you know, tribal and indigenous groups. Uh, the survey says that we have 705 different tribal groups that is existing in India right now that consist of 8.6 percentage of this 1.4 billion people. So you can imagine. So 705 indigenous groups still very active, intact. You know, they are living in their own, um, most of them live in their own uh, geographical location. And uh, they're there. In fact, there were more and you know, it is fast dwindling down. Languages, I mean, you may be surprised, 90,569. I just cross-checked this morning again in a news article in one of the census they have mentioned. It is mother tongue, not the number of languages. It is because of the syncopation and combination of and, uh, uh, many languages. Uh, but technically, there are around, they say it is very difficult to actually concretize and say there are some 800 and odd languages are there, uh, widely spoken. Out of that, 22 languages are spoken by 96% of people. So you can imagine even in a, in a, in a, in a parliament or in a state assembly or uh, to even to convey to every single 1.4 billion uh, population, uh, you need so much of interpretation, so much of you know regulations so that you know you can actually tell people what they need to do. So the diversity is you know very, very vast. And we also represent six different races of people uh, from different times. Um, the last one to colonize us uh, is the British, uh, which uh, they came and colonized. Before that, there was French, there was Portuguese, um, there are uh, Dutch. There are so many people who came and colonized us. And, uh, and then the last one was British. Even before that, there are different empires who come from the Middle East to the India, and then they have conquered, and then they left. And so, so we have a long, long history. So coming to the caste groups, there are 3,000 caste groups in India. And the subcaste is around 25,000 uh, subcaste are there. So you can imagine that the, when I say 3,000 um, caste groups, and the subcaste can be, you can put it as a subclan. Um, so for each caste, there are clans within that, and that is amounting up to 25,000. Uh, religion, there is major and minor religion. Uh, you know, uh, the word Hindustan or the word Hindu came from um, because people who lived along the Sindh River, and that's where the word Hindu came. And uh, today, uh, we are, our major religion is Hinduism, and uh, minor religions are Islam, Christianity, Baha'i, Sikh, and there are so many other smaller populations that is also living there in India. Now, um, there is a harmony even in if, when you go to a geographical location in any part of the country, there are people uh, that you know, practicing Islam or Hinduism or Christians, they all live together or in some places they live separately in different uh, uh, areas, but there is absolutely a harmony and absolutely uh, that uh, there's a lot of brotherhood that is there. Now coming to caste, I think that's a crux of it. And um, if you, once I finish this slide, probably I'll give you some time. If there is any questions, you can shoot the questions so we can clarify that. So that, that will be the, become the foundation for my next uh, part of my um, talk. So uh, this is, um, I think, as you can read it uh, uh, nicely, that uh, you know it is uh, from the Hindu scripture. The British shaped it also to uh, divide and rule. Now, before I start this, I need to tell this. You know, by putting this, it is not to you know uh, put one religion on focus um, because nobody knows whether this was written because this particular classification was done based on what they saw in the. In the, in the natural uh, realm or 
they have put this so that they can categorize people definitely you know it, we don't know either way how it came but there is some classification that is done so the classification is done based on a human morphology by the heads the brahmins the priests and academics and poets and teachers and scholars and they because they had the access to education during the time and uh, today it is a dominant they are dominate science business and government and uh, um, so many other uh, places. Uh, then comes the Kshatriyas, uh, that is the warriors and kings in those days. And uh, they uh, now just see this morphology, this triangle that you that you see here. The Brahmins they they are defined as the heads, okay, and the mouth they can speak and uh, they are the brain. The, um, um, so the the second part is the arms, that is Kshatriya, the warriors and kings. They need uh, the the hand to go and uh, you know. Uh, you know, to attack an enemy or to defend themselves, so Kshatriyas were there. And you see Kshatriyas, they're rulers, warriors, and administrators. So this is the second category of people. The third category of people is the Vaishyas, that is the cattle herders, agriculturists, artisans, and merchants. People had their own livelihood. So that is, they belong to the Thais. And then um, the Shudras, that is the feet, the servants are subordinates to Vaishnya, Vaishyas and Kshatriyas and Brahmins, because they actually, you know, one, two, and three category, these three categories of people will subjugate the Shudras, and they are usually the landless um, laborers. So if you see the um, uh, Shudras, um, government regards the Shudras as a scheduled caste. So some of them from Shudras also belong to this. They are alongside with the untouchables. Now, there is one category of people from Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras, they are part of the triangle. Please see this. They are not part of the triangle because they are, don't belong to any part of the body here. So they are called the Dalits, are uh, the untouchables. They do all the lower order work or subordinate to all. And um, they are also categorized uh, in, in terms, you can see it here, scheduled caste. Okay, they are categorized as scheduled caste. Now, interestingly, now, the, the, if you see the hierarchy and if you see the, the triangle, the triangle says they are smaller in population, little bigger, little more and little more, and then they constitute the dominant uh, in population wise. But at the same time, you know, um, you know, you will see that, you know, they are the one who subjugate and there is oppression from the upper caste to the Dalits or the scheduled caste. So I think it's very important to uh, understand this dynamics. So this is where the caste lays. Now, uh, you, uh, I also have to say that this is also classified based on occupation. So they felt a priest in his lineage or her lineage, they will remain as a priest or a poet or a teacher or a scholar. They wanted the warriors to follow only as a warrior. They wanted to do the business class to do only business. And they wanted the, you know, people who did the shudras, who did all the uh, work as, uh, as servants, they wanted to remain as servants. They want the, that is the upper caste always wanted them to be remaining as servants. And then the Dalits, the untouchables, they were always an outcast and they never wanted them to. There. Of course, things have changed a lot now. Um, things have uh, moved. Um, there is a lot of uh, crisscrossing, uh, you, know, you know, people marrying, intermarrying with caste, but it has its, they have to pay their own price. For example, uh, uh, even now in the place that I come from in South India, there are places of, um, I mean, uh, there are cases of honor killing. Uh, because uh, you, if somebody from any of this upper caste marries a Dalit, you know, uh, usually uh, there is something called honor killing where, uh, you know, you feel that, you know, you, that person has sacrileged uh, their, uh, their community and thereby, you know, the person can be even killed uh, if they marry uh, from another caste. So, 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 so that is, it's real even now. Though at one point that education has brought things and changed things, but you know, still there are um, times that we see that you know um, this instance still happen uh, in our society.
Now I'll just take a break. Um, Stephen, is there any questions that has come out based on this, um, or can I continue? Is there any questions? I'm sorry, I'm, I was muted. Yes, there's one question. What does scheduled language mean? Okay, um, good. Uh, so the word scheduled is uh, given uh, actually by the British. Um, scheduled cast, scheduled means to be scheduled as uh, the lower cast. So, so this is the schedule. Uh, th there are two types of scheduled. One is scheduled caste, that is the caste Hindus, and then the scheduled tribes. So it is, uh, it is the president who can actually stamp someone as a tribe or a, you know, or a particular caste. So when, when we got independence, uh, we just followed what was written in the census in the, from the British. So we are still using the word scheduled caste, uh, which, um, which means the, they are scheduled based on certain categories, okay? So when I say um, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, if this, I can put, see the same triangle, if you look at it, you know, uh, the government no more, I mean, the government cannot use this, but uh, they use a different category. We call it OC. Okay, let me put like this. Uh, there is something called, uh, mm. Uh, they call this OC now, that is uh, open category. And then there is another category called BC, that is backward cast. And then there is another category called MBC, most backward cast. And then they call this scheduled cast SC and SD. Now, Though I say Dalit, and though it is says as scheduled caste, but a reservation, when I say reservation in India, there is reservation for each category of these people. If they are OC, BC, MBC, and SC and ST. In this category, if anyone falls, you know, even an educational institution, if somebody has to join an educational institution, if they have a certificate saying that they are a BC or MBC or SC or ST, based on that you have a reservation the student has a reservation to get into the uh, college or a course same thing in government jobs also there is based on the caste you know there is a reservation that is um, given so um, so this is quite important so everybody um, except the oc uh, the rest of them will will have a certificate saying that you are a BC or an MBC and then the caste name will be there or a clan name will be there or they belong to SC and ST. Originally, the SCs are the one uh, which is uh, put categorized as Dalits as the untouchables. But now, because in the reservation category that the government has included SC and ST together, so they are looked together as untouchables now in one way, okay? But actually it is not. Okay, but some of the tribals, you know, are also categorized as um, the, the untouchables and then people, you know, still keep them away. Yeah, so I think I have explained that. Is there any other questions, Stephen? No, there's not at this time. Okay, 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 let me move ahead. So what is this modern day slavery? And uh, I will just quickly uh, run into this um, and then probably, you know, try to explain. So, uh, so India is a home for some 14 million modern day slaves, nearly half of the to total world population, as you see it. And um, as you see in the second uh, point that I mentioned that, you know, tens of millions of people who belong to the so-called lower caste, that is, uh, you know, the scheduled caste and Dalits and the indigenous communities. Uh, we call them call them Adi Vasis. Adi Vasis mean Adi means um, the early or from the original. Okay, and Vasis is people who live. So people who are living from the beginning. Okay, or beginning. Adi means beginning. So beginning 
uh, and from the beginning, people are living so there. The Adivasis are, we can call it the natives in, 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 in better understanding. So this is uh, uh, so this is the status right now. Now let's see the categories of that. Okay, so this is just a um, 2018, um, um, you know, statistics. So um, some 66 percent of forced labor and the forced marriage percentage and a few things are there. But let me quickly go into the categories of the modern day slavery and let me explain to you this. Uh, so human trafficking, I think uh, it's very common. It's there in every part of the world and uh, human trafficking. And uh, now human trafficking um, is um, widely spread, especially from, uh, it, 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 it also has a connotation with the poverty level uh, the people BPL below poverty line, you know, sometimes that they, they get hooked to it because uh, there can be a mediator who can come to a village and you can ask and say that you know for, they need a job, so they may uh, promise a job and then they may take them. And there is a there is one way of human trafficking. People don't even know that they are trafficked, but they will be part of it. And there are some people, you know, they're owed in different ways. And that is one way There are trafficking uh, of women, uh, trafficking people for uh, forced labor. So there are different categories in human trafficking. And then one of the corridors that we have is from the Northeastern part from, we have bordering Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan and China and Burma that is there in the Northeastern part of India. So that is also there is, um, you know, they say there's a corridor of uh, for trafficking. So people some of, sometimes they're trafficked from the uh, east and then they are brought to the west so that, you know, west of uh, India so that, you know, people are, uh, people cannot go back even if they know that they're trafficked. Forced labor. When people are forced to work against their will, I think it's, um, it's quite common. Um, uh, now forced labor and bonded labor has a very close connotation. Uh, generally, uh, these are people whom they are given a huge amount of money, 50,000 or sometimes 10,000, as near as uh, 10,000, which is 120, $130. They are given a wholesome money and then they will be told next three months, you can work in my farm or in a, a Brooklyn or a, or a stone quarry or in some place. So they will, they'll be asked to come and work. And, uh, but at, at the end of the three months, they'll be told that for the 10,000, you have not finished work enough. So they will be asked to work some more. And when they work uh, enough, then they will say that there is interest for this uh, money that I have advanced to you. So usually a money is advanced. And that's where the people get into the trap and then they come and give the, get the money and they may not be able to pay the money back. And then that is where they get into the trap. So the interest will keep adding. And then they, some of them, uh, we have uh, some of the rescued uh, bonded laborers are uh, even two generations or th three generations, they work in the same Brooklyn because the grandfather would have got the money and then the grandchild will be still working there. They would have got married and all these usual things happen, but they, ha they have to be in the vicinity uh, in, a, in a stone quarry or a Brooklyn and they have to continue to work. So bonded laborer, I think it's a uh, quite a common one in the, in the southern part of India and in the northern part of India, there are lots of rescues that are still happening, uh, but it is not easy uh, to find because a lot of times people are scared to tell that they are bonded so uh, only when we get a tip off or you know then only you know some ngos ngos government it is a close knit it's uh, i will be talking to you about that how that release is, how release happened then child slavery i think um, millions of children across the world are exploited in many forms and i think uh, children uh, uh, from in our context sometimes again the, the the issue of poverty comes in very strongly where the parents need money right now, uh, probably to pay debt. So if there's a mediator who comes and says, you know, you send your child to work, I will become a businessman or businesswoman. Uh, you, uh, you know, we will ready to pay 30,000 rupees next three years, forget about your child. So we will take the child and put them in some place. So usually they are taken to a bakery, baking unit, 
or in a snack making unit in some far off place and they live in such unhygienic condition and they lose their childhood and then they uh, that, that's one kind of slavery uh, people may not know the children cannot move about all uh, outside because then you know the child line and all other volunteers are very active now so so they are usually bound home bound uh, so it's very tragic sometimes when we release a child uh, uh, and then the, the other trend is also um, uh, for grazing animals uh, like goats or uh, cows you know ch children are engaged so the children are engaged for one year two years and as an, an advance amount is given to the parents and parents happily send because uh, that is the status of their uh, you know income level so they find it easier way to get money and to you know um, pay the debt another way uh, uh, child and forced marriage i think um, that is something that i'm going to talk to you about in the next slides uh, child and forced marriage i think uh, child marriage is also happening uh, sporadically um, uh, especially in certain communities it's not everywhere it has come down heavily the government has taken lots of steps to you know abolish child marriage but still it's happening here and there and especially in certain communities child marriage is uh, part of their tradition um, so, so child marriage. So child marriage is considered as slavery. Um, um, Descent-based slavery. Uh, many people are born into slavery because of their class or caste. Um, uh, for example, um, the the tribe that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, the, the Irula tribe, uh, who is in predominantly in the southern part of India, and uh, they actually um, uh, they the, the um, from the statistics says that. 95% of the uh, released bonded laborers are from this particular Irula tribe. And that is a tribe that I'm working for uh, as, a, as an institute, as an individual, as, uh, as a community, as a school of social work. That is what we are working for uh, to bring them out uh, from that uh, attitude that they will not be trapped by anybody else. Because 95% is a huge number uh, because they live as an outcast within the same village so what happens is you know people uh, use them uh, it's an easy trap for them so usually people take them because they are semi nomadic now they take them and they'll say we will give them food we'll give you accommodation all you need to do is just do work so people get trapped and then they don't know after some time that they're actually trapped so descent based um, slavery domestic slavery i think um, uh, that's also coming uh, loudly without you know it is all under disguise there are people who are brought from a village to a town and then they are stuck there um, i'm sure some of you would have heard about the stolen generation uh, in australia and uh, you know the stolen generation that you know that uh, uh, the children were taken away from the indigenous communities in australia and then they were uh, taken to a convent, you know, given them, uh, you know, taught them English and, you know, given them fork and spoon, how to handle a fork and spoon and to cook food and to sing and all kinds of things. And then, uh, then they were taken uh, to, uh, as a maid uh, or, uh, you know, uh, in, in an outhouse in a, in a, in a white man's house in, 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 in Australia. And that is what that was happening 100 years ago. And, uh, and you know that the whole, you know, generation was called the stolen generation only the young girls were targeted from the indigenous communities and they were taken if you want to know more about it i think you should watch the movie uh, rabbit proof fence it's a beautiful movie about two young sisters who were taken away to a convent and then they escape from the convent and it was a real story and these two um, sisters uh, will also be shown towards the end of the movie it's a very moving story it's called rabbit proof Fence. You should watch that if you are interested in, you know, how domestic slavery uh, can lead to a genocide. Actually, they wanted to do a genocide, so that's why they wanted to take away all the girl child from the uh, indigenous communities, so that you know they, they will no more, you know, you know, um, you know, reproduce and um, and then uh, then you know the reproduction that is what they wanted to stop, and then they wanted to. You know, you know, bring in this um, DNA and the, the white gene, the dominant gene, this is the, you know, not dominant gene. So all kinds of things. It, it is explained in that movie, but domestic slavery is very much part of it. 
slavery in supply chains. I think this is something that um, definitely it is very, very modern. Um, sometimes some of you would have heard some uh, noise, uh, people make noise about, you know, do not buy from this so that, you know, because this is not, um, you know, this is made in some country by, by providing cheap labor and with unhygienic condition, people have worked for this and then that is sold at a price here in a developed nation. So um, sometimes an underdeveloped nation will be used for that. Uh, now, this is also a trend that is happening right now, in, especially in textile industry, where people are brought from a village and huge number of people and they're brought and they are kept in a particular vicinity. And then they were asked to work in a, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a huge, um, you know, display of textiles. And uh, they will be working with a lot of um, constraints, especially the girls, uh, young girls who come to work. And uh, we also get reports of suicide uh, a lot. And we have understood uh, those are not necessarily suicides. It is also because of some other torture or harassment and things like that, but it comes out as suicide. So these are things that, you know, that is coming up. Uh, but it is very disguised. It doesn't look like, you know, that they are in slavery or they are bonded by a chain or, you know, things like that. But, you know, it is one kind of disguised way of slavery. So um, now this is what is the different forms of slavery that is happening right now uh, in different forms. Um, now, uh, is there any questions, Stephen? Yes, there are. Um, we have yeah. um, three questions here. Okay. Um, so the first question is that the language associated with caste upper and lower has been challenged by both anti-caste intellectuals and communities, preferring oppressed and oppressor caste, dominant and non-dominant caste. Legal terminology fails to capture the true essence of caste because Brahmins and other dominant castes are referred to as general, implying a sense of normal and others as non-normative. I guess that's not a question, it's just- a Yeah, statement. it's a more common, yeah. That's a good analogy, yep. And the uh, there is a question here, do the, I'm not saying this correctly, so pardon me, do the- Dalits. Dalits. Yes. Say it again. Dalits. Yes, do the Dalits people share the same DNA as people from Africa? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't have anything to prove that, but um, see the, 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 if you see the, the migration, uh, there are different schools of thought, okay? Um, there are different schools of thought. Uh, there is one um, school of thought is that um, people moved from different places and they came to settled in India. So the first group of people is the race of Negritas. They, they, we believe that it, they came from Ethiopia and then they moved from the Middle East and then they came through the uh, uh, north uh, western part of India and that's how they came in. So a, a, a group of people um, uh, in India, especially the tribal people, they belong to the Negritas race. Uh, so there is a lots of studies still going on to say, yes, they are um, from this particular, these and these are the people that is from this particular tribe. If I, if I have to tell you, there is an uh, island that we have called Andamans and Nicobar uh, in the Arabian Sea, uh, in the, in the Beng Bay of Bengal. So there is, it's called Andamans and Nicobar Island. If you just Google it and see, it's all smaller islands. There are hundreds of uh, smaller islands. And still now, even now, there is Jaravas, the Ongis, the um, Sentinelis, uh, the Jaravas, there are roads made, so there are people who can see them, but the Ongis and the, and the, and the Sentinelis, even now, people cannot enter into that, and they look very similar to the Africans. Um, so it, it, it is, uh, you know, absolutely the same. We don't know how they even came there and landed there. There are different thoughts again into that, but they are there. Even in the mainland in India, even in South India, there is a one particular group called the Paniya tribe, P-A-N-I-Y-A, -A -A, Paniya. Um, the, the Paniya tribe, 
They say they came from, they were taken as slaves from East Africa uh, by the Portuguese and, the, and then they were sold as slaves and then they started to live up in that. There is another tribe called, um, um, there is another tribe in an, another part of uh, the uh, country where near Goa, uh, that is, um, let me show you, uh, near Goa that I'm showing in the map in the southern part. Um, so they also were brought by the Portuguese, that they say, and then they were sold here, and then they slowly moved up, especially in this belt. Uh, they are there. Um, so uh, they all look very similar uh, morphology and the DNA. So definitely, yes, I would say there are quite a few people who have the similar uh, the similarities. In fact, the Pania tribe, they say, uh, they still wear a big, um, um, uh, you know, earring. Um, um, I, I don't have the slides for me to show you now, but they still have a huge big earring. Uh, as the age grows, the earring grows bigger and bigger and bigger. So when you see older women, they will be having a earring which is much bigger, um, you know, and it, it, is a, it is a leaf actually that they roll it and keep it. They say there is a similar tribe in the eastern part of Africa which has the same kind of, um, you know, um, you know, the, the same kind of earring. So they say probably uh, uh, they were brought from there. And there is another, I mean, there are different schools of thought. It's all an assumptions, but definitely as somebody uh, who were questioned it, uh, yes, uh, there are DNAs that match. In fact, there are DNAs, there are studies that have been done. That are, they, there are some parts of the uh, uh, eastern part of Indian tribe and the Australian Aboriginals have sh shared the similar DNA. So that's definitely possible, yes. Okay, we also have a couple more questions. Um, in America, there are safe houses for those who try to escape from human traffickers. Does mm -hmm. India have some sort of safe house or any way to contact someone to get help in escaping the conditions they are enslaved in? Um, of course, there are a lot of numbers, phone numbers and things like that that is given. Uh, we don't have safe houses, but people who are rescued from them, they are kept in homes and there are, uh, there are projects called Ujwala, there's a project. So there, so, um, there are, um, they are kept there, run by NGOs. And that is, I think that is what you mean by safe houses. So yes, uh, when they are rescued, they are kept there. And then till they are repatriated, they are kept there. Uh, so they can always come and contact and you know, they can get connected and then they can be safe there. Yes, it is there. Okay, we are getting quite a few questions here. So um, I don't know, uh, let's ask one more question and then we can uh, I'll keep asking questions, but uh, let's have Dr. Salman uh, finish his, his presentation. So Dr. Salman, uh, two, two last questions before we allow you to continue. What's become of those tribes today? Uh, which tribe? I mean, that is uh, the... That was a question from uh, Clarice Stark. So Clarice, uh, can you uh, respond in the Q&A to which tribes you're referring to? And while you're doing that, uh, we have a question. What is the most common discrimination faced by the lower caste people in the modern days in India? Okay, I'm gonna talk to you about that. So that's my next slide. So I will be using a whiteboard or a jam board to use that and to see how when- All how right, so yeah. why don't we just continue with your presentation? Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Dr. Sol so yes. Dr. Solomon, uh, the per uh, Clarice clarified she was referring to the what's become of the Jarvis. Uh, and again, I can't the, can't say the Dalit Dalits. Okay, the Jarvis and they are still living in the island all by themselves. Um, occasionally, some people, some anthropologists, they could actually get in to the village, but it's usually not. And I, I don't know, three years ago or four or five years ago or some, some years ago, an American actually who came tried to as a missionary who tried to go in and then he was killed and he was, his body was just thrown into the sea. So, so I think, you know, those are things People don't want to come because they still use a spear. 
So people cannot even go, even the locals, uh, the other tribes will not uh, try to go, but they do say that the number is reducing, the number of people there in that island is reducing. Uh, during tsunami, I remember very clearly there was an article that came saying, you know, probably they feared missing because it's an island and uh, the tsunami was just, you know, the waves just came across the, their island. Uh, but we found they we found that these people have actually climbed up the mountain and then they were safe. I don't know how they got to know that there's some danger is going to come, but they they were safe. They were absolutely safe even after that. So they still continue to live in the exclusive islands uh, in and uh, in, in, in Andamans. So that is something. Uh, it's it's uh, you know uh, that is the indigenous knowledge that they have, and you know uh, that's great. So um, let me share this. I think you're able to see the board, the whiteboard? Yes. OK, great. So um, uh, as, you, as I was telling you and as you are uh, that about the caste system, and then we talked about the different types of uh, you know, slavery, uh, what happens in a, now, you know, right now, what is happening and how this discrimination happens? Now, I just quickly like to draw this. Um, let's say this is a village. Okay, let's say this is a village. And then uh, usually, you know, usually not all villages, but usually um, the village is um, always uh, divided uh, into two. Okay, and the road will just, you know, cut across um, between the two. So let's say um, I told you there are four categories, uh, the OC, the BC, and the MBC. So let's say that the any upper caste, you know, any upper caste will live here. Sorry. Um, so any upper caste will live here. So, and this is the lower caste village. Okay. So the village name will be the same. Okay. The village name will be the same. But when you say village name, the main village, if you say main village, that means this belongs to the upper caste, okay, the main village. And then the lower caste, that is the Dalits, you know, they live here. The Dalits live here. And they are also called the ESC, okay, the scheduled caste. Now, interestingly, because I don't know how this word came about in uh, South. Interestingly, this part, the, where the lower caste, the Dalits live is called colony. It's an English word, but all people will know this word. They say, we live in a colony. Colony means everybody knows, okay, then you belong to a Dalit or you're an SC or you're a lower caste. And any, any, anybody about that, that is, I told you about that, you know, the Kshatriyas or whatever, you can call it, or the most backward caste, uh, or it can be a MBC or a BC, you know, they are an upper caste. So what happens is when you just enter a village, you will know whether you're entering a main village or a Dalit village, because this people here usually will not come into the Dalit colony usually. There are some places it has happened that people started to come in both the places, but in most places, you know, you will see that these people will not come. Now, the Dalits may go there, but if they go there, there are certain things that they were doing before. Like, for example, if they're wearing a turban, they have to remove the turban and put it on their waist and they have to tie it. Or if they're wearing a chapel, they have to carry it in their hand. Now, this was happening before, 20, 30 years ago, it was still happening. Uh, things have changed a lot, but still there are some places this discrimination is still there. Now, let's say um, there is a well. Okay. Now, 
though the both cannot use the same well you know uh, this is a resource for them separately and this is a resource for them separately um now uh, there are lots of things for example the another reason why a dalit may enter here is if there's a death here okay if there's a death uh, you know people who do carry especially there's a dead animal or there's a death you know usually they carry the dead and then they go and help them bury okay so uh, the dalits are still considered as um, you know as the the lowest uh, caste now interestingly the dalits are people who are landless laborers okay landless they are the landlords okay so why do people subjugate the them and then why they have to receive the subjugation also is also because the the owners of this land are the one who gives the job for this landless laborers they are they are minimal in number but they have more people and then they can actually you know be the laborers uh, for them so they always are on dependent now over a period of time what has happened is that the dalits are educated now and they now they are educated now they have come up in life so they no more depend on the landlords for money or for income or for their daily expense so what happens you know there is an empowerment that takes place and then they are sustainable now now but still however the discrimination is still there you know when i say discrimination um uh, nobody will take a, a an upper caste man will not uh, go and ask for a girl or um, from a dalit or from a dalit to an upper caste because they like to you know it is very the, the circle is very clear and it's well defined sometimes people fall in love uh, and then uh, they either not be able to sometimes if somebody is willing to fall in love with the dalit and they may be able to live here but not somebody who falls in love from here and they can live in the upper caste uh, village it's very difficult probably there will be tortured so usually people leave the village and sometimes that's why i told you in the beginning of my presentation that this honor killing also happens there now this is not the end of this there is an also another community here okay uh, they are the yes the and now this is not in all scenarios i'm talking about purely in the uh, the state that i come from in the southern parts of southern states in most places this is there so there is upper caste then the dalits and then the scheduled tribe uh, the tribe that i'm going to introduce you to the, the so that you know it's easier for you to understand the irula tribe i r u l a irula irula tribe um uh, so they the irula means darkness and uh, they were originally warriors they were living in the forest or the fringes of the forest actually uh, so their life was so different than they were indigenous but over a period of time because of so many other pull and push factors you now they moved to the plains and they come and settled here now when they have come they were not part of either this or this so they are given a separate uh, you know location not even given actually they have possessed an illegal probably an occupation they may not have any papers for this land usually it is near a lake or a pond um, that each village has so so it usually they live uh, closer to that now interesting thing is you know or not interesting probably the disgusting thing is um, the upper caste people look down upon the dalits and sometimes the dalits look down upon them they will not be entertained here you know it is not possible so literally i would say there are three layers you know in the in the place that we are working there are three layers there's a main village there's a colony and then there is a smaller hamlet okay usually there are five families six families maximum 15 some places they are 25 
but they are geographically little distant, but they belong to the same village, but they may not get all the welfare benefits because they usually say they don't have any legal entitlements to say that they are belonging to this place. There is no door number. There is no um, legal, uh, you know, any legal uh, you know, ID cards that is given by the government. So what happens is they are a non-entity in the same place, but they are the actual natives, right? Now, this is the group of people we are trying to work now and uh, they are the people who are most vulnerable for uh, becoming slaves, especially as bonded laborers. In the past few years, I mean, in the last 18 years that we've been working with bonded laborers, you know, a lot of the 95% of them belong to this particular group called Irula tribe. Um, interesting uh, features about this Irula tribe. I think you got this uh, picture, so I just uh, keep it here as a frame. Now, let me move on to my presentation. So, um, as you see here, uh, the 95% uh, release bonded laborers are rehabilitated by the government. See, the government plays a very, very important role in releasing them because without the government's uh, knowledge, not, without their, their uh, support, it is impossible to release them. Uh, follow up and building uh, livelihood alternatives are a big challenge because a lot of them have not uh, seen the other world. So when they are released, you know, it is not easy for us to go there and tell them, okay, go live your dream. Uh, you know, you, you can't, uh, you, you, we cannot say that because they, we have to start providing things right from the basic, right from legal entitlements to so many other uh, things. Um, let me show you, uh, I don't know how many of you are able to identify this picture, you know, um, I don't know. Um, if you can identify this picture, this is taken in Florida. Uh, four years ago or three years ago, these two young, uh, not young, these two Irula tribe, uh, you know, they came to Florida uh, to catch snakes because uh, the, the one of the main uh, identity of this Irula tribe is that they catch snakes. They catch snakes, uh, they are very fearless. And uh, so um, I think they were brought down to Florida to catch snakes uh, because they are very good in that. And uh, that is their, uh, probably the traditional occupation uh, before 70s, they uh, caught snakes and then they skinned it and then they are selling it. But uh, now the laws are very strict that you can't catch a snake and skin it and uh, you, know, you give it for, uh, you know, for a price. Uh, they may be behind the bars. So now nobody catches it, but now, people have started to use them, uh, you know, if there is a snake menace in a particular area, you know, they are called, uh, you know, and they are also recruited in the forest department. And also they are also recruited in, uh, uh, you know, snake menace extraction, but these are all very, very minimal number of people. The rest of the people, their livelihood issues are still a big question mark. So they are uh, the Irona tribe in Florida. Uh, now you can see the other picture and you can see the how they have lived. You know, it's just uh, four sticks and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's just four sticks and, you know, then they live together as a, you know, um, in, a, in, a, in a small hut. And uh, usually during a rainy season, their huts are, you know, you, they live always near the banks of a pond or a lake. And during rainy season, the, the water seeps in and then they find it very difficult. They have usually moved to a nearby school or things like that for a, for a short while. So this is how they live. And um, now let me give some more things. Now, you see, there's a, here's a man who is trying to dig something. Actually, he's not digging. He is actually trying to trap the rats. In the 80s and 70s and 80s, these people are engaged. The Irulab tribes are engaged because they are very good at catching rats also. Uh, because uh, nobody was using pesticides those days. So uh, they, used to, they were asked to catch rats. So for every day, they will come in groups and they'll, they'll catching rats and, uh, you know, to keep the, you know, the, 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 the growing paddy, you know, um, uh, well. So it, it is important that they also catch rats and they catch snakes. Now, that is also, as I told you, every cast every group had their own traditional occupation. So th this is their occupation. That is also one of the ways why people discriminated them. 
because they catch rats and they catch snakes so they don't want to and they also eat rats and not much nowadays but you know they generally eat rats and uh, i think they are they, they i mean the, the say, tribalness so it's fine it is their uh, livelihood it's their life and they want to eat it it's fine but there are discrimination based on that there are times where when we apply for community certificates that that they are saying they are in the Irula tribe to to make them legalize that they are a citizen in this, this country uh, there are times that people have asked uh, you know okay can you bring a snake and catch a snake then only we know that it is not necessarily not everybody catch a snake because i told you that it is there 20 years ago 30 years ago people were catching snakes but now they are not so you know it is like you are asking a native person you know suddenly okay now you know how so we'll give you a bow and arrow can you shoot a bow and arrow i i don't think it is uh, you know it is absolutely not necessary to do that right so so this is their traditional occupation now i have also put the image down uh, here um, uh, now this was a recent even last uh, last week uh, uh, we have uh, one of the student of mine you know uh, he did social work with us and uh, interestingly he um, uh, he was a released bonded laborer and uh, and he um, actually um, um, he he was rescued when he was a child and he lost both his parents and uh, then um, certain NGOs came forward to help him and then he studied and he came to do social work uh, probably that is the first of its kind for us uh, for, to for a released bonded laborer pursuing studies and came to do social work and uh, last week um, he got married and um, our school was supporting him to get him married and uh, literally our school was his home and um, so that is just to say that but this is one among the thousands um, a lot of them uh, drop out of school uh, by the time they are in eighth standard or standard eight or by the time they finish school because um, uh, there is discrimination one one side in schools the second side is uh, you know the, the 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 need at home is that he that he or she has to work if it is a, a girl usually at 13 and 14 they get get them married i think that is something that is that is very common among this tribe uh, and you will see a girl who is 21 years old having two children or three children when they are 21 and then when they are at 40 probably they are a grandmother because they would have had the children would have grown up and then they will give birth to children so they become a grandmother so it is it is a little alarming because if you ask the question why um, you know there are hundred, there are a list of things that they say that has a tradition and why they get them married at such young age so <clears throat> i have some facts about them uh, what you see, I think uh, you you have already read through. No legal entitlement to prove citizenship. Uh, still, a group of people who are not uh, having certificates to say that they are a citizen of this country, though they are the natives. They've been living uh, for a long, long time, uh, for thousands of years probably. Uh, lives as a non-entity in a village, even in a welfare scheme comes. They are not considered because they are not a legal citizen. There is no papers to say that they are legal citizens. Um, uh, landless uh, laborers, definitely they are, uh, you know, daily wages. They don't know how they're going to, uh, you know, have an income the next day. Uh, of course, there are quite a few people now we are helping. That is one of our work that we're doing, that we're trying to, you know, get legal entitlements so that, you know, we can, um, we can put them on some schemes. Uh, we have a very good scheme called uh, Fair Price Shops where uh, the, it is part of the Food Security Act that we have that uh, people who are below poverty line can uh, get 32 kgs or 33 kgs of rice for free. Uh, but it has its own repercussions also. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, that I will talk to you a little later if there is a question on that. But otherwise, you know, some of them get that and some of them don't. Uh, Self-inflicted and instilled fear for survival. Um, they are always on threat they are always on threat um, the threat is um, because they don't own that land that they live uh, and they just 
uh, an occupant and they just put a semi structure like a hut um, there is always a threat if they don't cooperate with the village people they will be always be threatened that they can be thrown out of the village or they may have to find their own place so that 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 is still there uh, so we are also actually working towards you know giving them a land which is theirs in their name uh, no proper housing water and other resources in fact uh, um, electricity is a big issue um, we still see hamlets why we don't see electricity is also again because there is no legal entitlements there is no so there is no provision so people live in uh, typically to their name irula meaning darkness they live in the dark uh, so sometimes some people come and help and uh, so we see uh, children going to school so we ask uh, you know uh, people from different places and we our students raise money our students work with them directly i also work along with them so we uh, we raise money and uh, some sometimes you know we uh, I tell them you know give them solar lamps so that you know we can uh, provide them with solar lamps uh, education is still a distant dream um, now, what you see in this picture uh, that I told you that he has done MSW is one in a, you know, it's a once in a blue moon, I would say, but uh, it's still a distant dream. Uh, not many are willing because especially girls get married early and the boys usually get to work early so that their family can survive. Uh, uh, excellent in traditional herbal medicine. I think uh, this is what we are trying to tap uh, their thing. You know, they're especially they're very good uh, for uh, you know they can uh, because they handle snakes they know uh, they have uh, medicines for uh, snake bites they don't use any of the english medicine uh, or allopathy they use traditional herbal medicine so some of them are trade secrets for them they don't tell to everybody but they use it and uh, they're very good in uh, traditional healing especially on uh, herbal medicine uh, so some projects are there on to you know grow herbal medicinal plants so that you know they can you know but i don't know how far it is directly benefiting them uh, probably a company will use up all their knowledge and patent it and probably you know they they may be left behind so that is a scare also so um, i'm not going to talk much about this uh, but i'm just putting it so so that if you have any question based on this so these are some of the work that we're doing right now when I say micro as an individual, meso as a family, and macro as a community, what are some of the things uh, that we we try to do and we are you know, asking people to do? So this is what I think uh, I have uh, for you. And if there is any questions, probably I will uh, answer along with uh, my slides. And yes, we, have, uh, we have a few more questions for you. Yeah. Um, Okay, let's see here. What what do you think the biggest barrier is to solving the modern slavery issue in India uh, since the issue is so systemic in society? Um, I think uh, the first one I would say is the failure to accept that is slavery. Um, though uh, a lot of now the government comes forward to work alongside with uh, NGOs, INGOs, education institutions, and a lot of awareness is coming on. But, um, you know, a uh, lot of times we like to deny that there is slavery. I think uh, especially by certain politicians, not all, but certain, some of them are really humane. Uh, and uh, a lot of policies that has come that is tightening the, the structure uh, so that, you know, nobody can fall into the trap, but still, I would say um, uh, corruption is also a big, um, uh, you know, play a big part as a big challenge, I would say, because uh, as I told you, the industries, the mega industries, the corporates, um, you know, when they employ people like this uh, for, a, you know, uh, as uh, um, they, they are not signed a contract. Uh, so they are, they are usually, um, you know what i would say is you know nobody is made as an employee directly they are uh, they come under a contract with some middleman and he will not sign any contract as it but he's called a contractor so that this middleman 
you know, they go to the village, they recruit people, bring them and supply to these industries. So the, 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 the industry, um, let, let me give an example, uh, let, let's say the textile industry, they will not employ them. It is a, the, the industry will give the money to the contractor, the contractor pays them, uh, you know, the amount. So what happens is, you know, there is a kind of evasiveness saying, oh, I don't, I'm not part of that. Uh, I don't know. We just ask for people. There are some recruiting agencies which just give them uh, the, the supply of uh, manpower for us. So this is how the, you know, the system works, but they all know very clearly that this is uh, happening. They are, we are using the vulnerability of these people. Okay, so so this is that is the biggest challenge uh, with the Yula tribe. Uh, I think uh, it is also uh, because of uh, the biggest challenge is uh, ignorance uh, from these people. So we are trying to um, tell our people that you know um, you know get them to education because education can definitely open their eyes. But sometimes they are very scared for education also because people who are educated uh, leave their tradition, leave their village, leave their um, you know farmer way of life, and then what happens is that they feel that uh, probably education will take their children away from who they are as an identity. Also, uh, that's also a scare. Not in Irula, but I have seen over a period of time that I have taught uh, a group of um, different kinds of uh, tribal students who have come to our school. Uh, I've seen that when they get educated and they go back, um, they want to marry an educated person from the same tribe. And then they don't uh, get to see another educated person like that, or they don't like someone like that. So what happens is uh, if they get married to a non-tribal or another tribal person, then it can become a, even more a barrier for them to send uh, or motivate children to go to school because they'll think, oh, you go to school, you will get married to somebody else and we will you will leave our identity so you will not uh, you know come back to us so that's the kind of fear also is there so these are some challenges especially i think this we will we have to come come across that because uh, the first generation of people who are learning and trying to come forward you know uh, this transition uh, is also we are finding it very very difficult uh, to you know uh, convince them to even for change um, without losing their um, tribalness. Yeah. Okay, we have a question here. What are the observable signs that expatriate Indian elites practicing caste and system in modern day slavery outside of India? Um, I don't know uh, outside India, but um, uh, one of the things that, I mean, caste can be practiced anywhere in any part of the world if you know that you belong to a particular caste. And um, I think um, one of the things that happen, uh, I, I would say that in marriage, um, the even though people, let's say somebody migrates to India, um, at least in the first few generations, one or two generations, they still like to take a bride or a bridegroom from their own caste system so that uh, the compatibility that they talk about saying that um, you know we have our own traditions we have our own way of uh, living we have so they always do that but i don't know about slavery um, apart i don't know much uh, in another country but uh, but within the country uh, again uh, you know it is very evident uh, where uh, you know, sometimes the when they work as a maid or, a, or different places, you know, they are not allowed to come to certain places in the house. And when they enter, they don't enter through the, the front door. They are always asked to come through the back door. So all those things are uh, kept even now, you know, the clear boundary is set uh, to do that. Outside the country, person can still practice caste uh, by doing that, by choosing only within their uh, community. Uh, and uh, even relating and uh, even confiding. If they come to know that they belong to another caste, sometimes, you know, they may be shocked uh, not to entertain that uh, relationship also, uh, which is very disguised. So probably in an another country, it is not easy to see also. So they, will, they can, you can practice whatever you want. 
but back in india uh, you know people know uh, it's it, it it's quite complex actually um, in fact um, one of the things that i've got to tell you is even among the same group of people there are discrimination i'll tell you one example um, even among the dalits there is discrimination for this one group of people uh, they are cobblers uh, their occupation is being a cobbler so this cobblers are people who uh, they skin the cow or a, or a bull you know and then they take that skin and then that's how they stitch the the sandals uh, in this is even now some people they do but some of them don't uh, so they they do that and they actually they eat a uh, beef okay so uh, they eat the meat of the um, bull or a cow whatever they slaughter to take the skin now they are looked down upon based on what they eat also uh, among the dalits themselves there are some people who don't and some people who eat so they people who don't eat look down upon those who eat uh, the meat um, so so it is still there okay um you have another question um who regulates the upper caste how how they pay and dallists how much is the salary working for the landlords uh, uh can i can you tell the first sentence statement of the question who who regulates the upper caste uh see among the upper caste there are quite a few number um, brahmin is only one but there are so many other upper caste uh, people there in different states it, it is named differently and you know that they are there uh usually um religiously there is one way of coming together uh the second one uh, is uh, they have their own associations um to regulate themselves and uh, a lot of people do not belong to any association or religious affiliation but they know that they belong to it and then they they are on themselves uh, it's not you know uh, there is a regulatory body it 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 is evolved as over a period of time and um, I, if you i tell between the landless and the landlords you know the the the, the daily wages are though the minimum wages act says a different thing of you know minimum 5000 or 6000 rupees you need to pay uh, in a month uh, but uh, now um uh, they they pay around i think um for 300 to 600 rupees is what is paid for a daily wage 300 to 600 but among that also if uh, the same work is done by a woman they are paid less, little lesser even now 100 or 200 rupees lesser uh, in the in the in the in the land when they how work. much how much did you say they get paid per day 300 uh, no the usually they are paid from 300 to 600 rupees which what is the equivalent of that in dollars uh, um in in dollars uh it is around um eight dollars eight or nine dollars a week for, for a day a day for a day now i'm talking about from 300 to 600 that means from four dollars to you know nine dollars so it depends on the work and the things like that. but again if a woman is also involved in the job the woman is always paid a little less up and compared to the cost of living does that 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 leaves them in poverty uh, uh yes because you don't get job all through the month every day all 30 days usually the manners of work will be only 10 to 15 days in a month uh, so they may have to have alternative livelihood so and again the in the land work will not be there every day uh, so there are places what they do in the olden days, what they do, they kept certain people to work for them and their farm only. Uh, so they never paid them every day, but they paid them as a grain. They gave them as grains. Okay, we will give you paddy so you can cook and eat food and things like that. But now things have changed. So they pay as a, as a monthly pay or a weekly pay or a daily wages. But generally, uh, a daily wage is something... You know, it is ranging between 300 to 600, 
is what they get. But again, if they, it's a rainy season, they don't get jobs. Uh, you know, all these things, if you put together, uh, they'll be in poverty. Um, so they may not be able to, you know, buy things as they like. So usually they end up in debt. All right, so we have a few more questions and we're, we're right at our time, but hopefully we can quick, quickly get to them. What is the most common discrimination faced by the lower caste people? Did we answer that already in modern day uh, India? Yes, uh, yes, we answered that. We answered that, okay. Uh, are certain religious, typic, uh, are certain religions typically grouped in the upper and lower castes? Uh, not necessarily. Because, um, you know, um, see, primarily we were uh, uh, people who are worshiping the five elements. Uh, I'm talking about 200, 300 years ago. All of us were, we see India was primarily 200 princely states uh, before we were colonized by the Brits uh, 200, 300 years ago because they only came together and they divided it as zones as Madras presidency, Mumbai presidency, like that. They, uh, so they, they categorized us and then, then we formed states and districts. Now, um, uh, uh, what was the question again? Can you please, sorry. Um, are there certain religions that are... Okay, are... okay. Uh, so, so, the, so yes, uh, so when people started to categorize themselves and they practice their own religion, they were practicing the you know, worshiping of nature, the pantheism was the prom prominent one. And then they, we gave images and people are worshiping there for ages, you know, even before the Brits came, you know, each one had their own sect and they were doing it. However, uh, they, there are people who felt in the last 300, 400 years, there are people who have felt the oppression and they have converted themselves to Buddhism or uh, Buddhism to Hinduism or um, Hinduism to Christianity, or some of them have moved to Islam. So all these things are also happening. Uh, but does it mean that once they converted, then they are free from the caste? No, sadly, no. I know places um, where there are two churches in the same village, one for the upper caste and one for the lower caste. Uh, the upper caste people will worship only with the upper caste people, the, you know, the lower caste people. Will worship. So, uh, so the caste, because it's a caste ridden society, because it's so deep inside, even after the, uh, you know, they want to come out of the oppression that they say, uh, but still they kept the caste intact. Uh, I don't know for whatever reason, uh, so that, you know, their identity is maintained or they still fa feel they are not accepted uh, each other. All right, and our last question, can you give some examples of for rehabilitation for released bonded laborers? Yeah, sure. Um, we've been, um, see the, usually when they're a bonded laborer, they are there for a year or two, or sometimes as I told you, a generation. So it's not easy for them to rehabilitate. So once they are released, usually the government uh, releases them and they give a release certificate. And once they're released, they are, the first five, 10 days is very crucial for them. So they are allotted a place to stay, uh, but they need training because they don't know absolutely, they do not know what to do uh, because it is like, you know, you're released from a vicinity and then they said, okay, you can go and live. What will happen to their livelihood? What will happen to their job? What will happen to the legal entitlements? Do we get it? How, how far we need to go? How, you know, all these things are a big question. So what they do is uh, the government also partners with NGOs and um, as educational institution like us, we have also partnered with them and with NGOs. And uh, sometimes uh, they come to a vicinity like us in a school where they come and stay for the families will come, five, six, 10, 12, 15 families will come there and then they stay there for a week. And then there are lots of training that we do uh, on uh, why they are here and what, how they can look at life and what are the opportunities, what are the livelihood. So we also try to map the skill set. So some of them may be very good in 
herding sheep. So then we will see whether we can get them some sheep so that they can, you know, take care of their livelihood. So like that, you know, we need to map. So that is one part because livelihood is going to be a big question mark. In fact, some of the tribal people, when they're released after one year, two years, uh, because usually two years long, we, uh, you know, walk shadow them, uh, walk along with them because there, are, there can be sometimes a lot of threats from the owners uh, to come back or there'll be threats for their life. So we will walk along for two years. So there are two parts. One is their livelihood where they need to sustain their life so that we need to provide. Uh, not we need to provide, we need to make them understand and then they need to find a suitable thing that they can do for themselves, which is, uh, otherwise, you know, it'll be very normative need that, you know, we are meeting, that we tell you what to do and you do it. So it has failed miserably before. So we always look for the felt need and their express need, and we try to work with them for two years. The another one is um, their basic amenities, for example, housing and the legal entitlement. I think that's a major uh, issue. Uh, so usually they'll put a hut and they live there because they can cope with any situation because they cope there in, as, a, as a bonded laborer. So when they come out, what we usually do is uh, we, we, we ask the, the, the government usually allots a land, a piece of land for them in some village so that you know, they can live in a place where nobody can come and threaten them or tell them to leave. So that's a government allotted land. So uh, in one instance, uh, as, a, as a school, what we did, um, that place where they lived, 13 houses, uh, it, is, it was flooding during, uh, it was Chennai floods 2015, I still remember. It was flooding, it was one feet of slush, but they were all living there in that hut. So when we went there, we had to foot, children are having scabies and so many things are happening. So our students are very moved. They said, let's do uh, the field work, the social work field work here instead of going to an agency, let's uh, start working towards. So we started to work and the students came up with a plan and with them uh, of building houses for them. So we don't know how we did it, but uh, we were able to manage to build 13 houses, uh, all, uh, you know, hut houses, but, you know, but we put a basement so that, you know, the children and the families are secured. So there are, uh, like this, it's not us, NGOs came in, came forward and, you know, so building houses, uh, bringing electricity to them, bringing portable water to them. So these are all part of the rehabilitation activities and sometimes it extends even more. Uh, so that, um, you know, uh, for that, I just wanted to end with this. Um, you know, this is my, this is one quote that I like the most. You know, every time when we go to the uh, hamlets, um, after climbing a great hill, one only finds there are many more hills to climb. So the work never ends. Actually, we can never say rehabilitation is over. For a person who lived for three generations or 10 years or five years in a vicinity and then comes out and they don't know what to do, sometimes we need to give an extra hand and to see, make them climb our, you know, many more hills. I think that is what uh, we do. Wow, I think I think the only word that we can say after this is wow, uh, Dr. Salman. Thank you so much for bringing us this knowledge and this information that I'm sure many of us had absolutely no clue about. Um, just fascinating your work, not only as an academic but as a humanitarian. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time with us this morning. We we really very much appreciate it. Thank you, and for those of you who are participating. Uh, we will be sending out a survey that you can complete. Uh, please do so, because that helps us as we um, work with uh, presenters here at Vital Voices. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. Thank you, Dr. Savani. I uh, wish you all a very happy and uh, warm weekend here in cold, cold Houston. Thank you. Thank you.